Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Sharin Tofai. Welcome to Hernia Talk Live. This is our weekly question and answer session every Tuesday. As you know, uh, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Hernia Doc, on Facebook at Dr. Tofai. Many, many of you are live streaming with us right now. And at the end of the hour, I will make sure that our session is readily available to you on YouTube. Our guest panelist today is Dr. Alexander Poor. He is a board certified general surgeon practicing in Philadelphia. And he is very unique in his practice because he focuses on core medicine, which many of you may understand as groin injuries and sports injuries and um, sports strains at the very famous Vincera Institute. You can follow him on Facebook at Vincera Institute. So I would like to welcome you now to Dr. Poor. Thanks so much for having me. Hey, thanks so much for accepting this. It's uh, late in the evening, your time. So I do appreciate you donating your time and you're still in the office. Here I am, yeah, didn't quite make it home in time. So, <laughs> so we have tons of questions that have been uh, provided ahead of time. We're gonna go through those hopefully. Uh, and as people come in, we'll make sure that their questions get answered. But um, I think as a general surgeon, it's very, uh, what you're doing is very much outside the scope of the average general surgeon. So I'd love to hear your story. Like, how did, how did your training go and how did you get involved with the Vincere Institute? Absolutely, so um, we're here in Philadelphia in South Philly is where Vincere is located. Um, and so I'm actually, I'm from the area originally. I went to Jefferson Medical College um, in Philadelphia for medical school and was looking at training programs and just down the road uh, was Drexel. And one of the reasons I was interested in that program is I was really interested in surgical oncology and they had a strong program. And the chairman there was this kind of well-known liver surgeon. That's oh, okay. uh, William Myers, who had been down at Duke for a long time. Yeah. And, you know, I had this vague understanding that he also had, operated on a bunch of athletes, but I, I didn't really understand that. So I showed up as an eager intern at Drexel um, and I was crushed to see that one of the Philadelphia Eagles was on his senses. I was so worried that this guy had a liver tumor or a complicated bile duct injury, only to find that he had a groin injury. And then I realized that really at that point in those days, Dr. Myers was really 75, 25, mostly treating groin injuries and a little bit of hepatobiliary. And so okay. certainly um, got into this a little bit backwards. And so then, you know, obviously I gravitated towards uh, taking care of the athletes. I was interested in it. And what I quickly found out was he was doing stuff that no one else in the hospital or any other rotations I went on really had mm -hmm. any idea. Um, and so right. some of the things that I thought were really interesting were just some of these techniques that he was using to manipulate the muscle. I would go see him sew muscle together and then I would go on another rotation and be taught, you can't sew the muscle together. And I'd kind of ask, like, you know, I, I just saw this other guy do it. He's the chairman. Like, what's about that? And people would just kind of shrug and move on. And so I realized that there was something unique going on. So I really did gravitate towards it. I spent two years in the lab, still kind of preparing for a surgical oncology fellowship. And sometime during those two years, he asked me to join him on this venture, which is he was leaving academia, setting up shop down um, in South Philly down at the Navy Yard in a venture that he was kind of collaborating with some of the local health systems um, to build something new. So he could do something that really kind of stepped outside the realm of general surgery, outside the existing realm of sports medicine in order to treat these injuries in a comprehensive way. And so then basically I finished up my training as quickly as I could. So I could come down here and did a two-year fellowship with him and been partners with him now for about seven years. And no kidding. It's been a lot of fun. That's a great really, story. Kind of, yeah, fall into yeah. yeah. So good timing on your part. And then, so I'd love to interview him one day and see how he went, how he made that leap. But yeah, so you did a fellowship with him as well? I did, yeah. So he, he and we have a fellow now, we, we have a two-year fellowship. It's, um, it's, it's a leap. It really is a leap um, to say, for me, uh, I'm going to go do this what what on one level really sounds like a small niche um operation right uh as opposed to kind of like 
everything else in general surgery, which made sense. This was a kind of a mysterious realm. Uh, but then really once you kind of dive down into it, you realize there's this whole universe of variations and, and, and it kind of seems like an endless field to me now that I'm here. Um, and it's really exciting to kind of be a part of exploring it um, and kind of pushing the boundaries out in the different directions. And that's what we need is kind of more people really jumping in, the, in with two feet because that's when innovation really starts to happen is when you get a lot of people kind of exchanging ideas. So you and Dr. Myers are trained general surgeons. You also have orthopedic doctors and a rehabilitation doctors, I assume. Yes. Yeah. So we, um, you know, we treat muscular injuries. And so the people who we tend to kind of collaborate with and get, you know, interact with tend to be orthopedic surgeons and the non-operative sports med docs, as well as physiatrists. The whole realm of sports medicine is kind of, is, is, a, is a whole bunch of people that there's not a ton of general surgeons in that realm. And so it's really fun kind of seeing all this stuff from the orthopedics perspective and then also very much from the ultrasonographer's perspective. There's a lot of radiologists and sports med docs who, who see these injuries by ultrasound but never see them in the operating room. And yes, the true. Surgeons who understand they know what muscular injuries are, but they don't really want to go any near, anywhere near the groin. So it's a fun place <laughs> to just kind of incorporate all these different perspectives and try to put them into one under one roof. So on that uh, note, our very first question is more uh, to just define what is a core muscle injury. That is a great question, and so I will try not to be too long winded here. This this could probably take up the hour, but I'll just say. There's a lot of misnomers. There's a lot of unfortunate language associated with these yes. injuries. And I think that's why I'm doing, well, I'm, I'm delighted to be here, but you know, I'm talking about something that isn't a hernia. And that's probably one of the most important take home messages is when we're right. talking about a core muscle injury, that is a distinct entity from an inguinal hernia or a femoral hernia or some of these other uh, processes that take place in the, in the same part of the body. So what we call a core muscle injury, really we call the core is your chest to mid thigh. And the reason we have those boundaries is basically the most important muscles of the core from, from my perspective are, and if it's okay, I'll share my screen here. Yeah, that'd be, this up. that'd be great. Um, we really, you know, so can you guys see this stuff here? Is that coming through? It looks perfect. Okay, great. So the rectus abdominis, which is our six pack, which, you know, is there somewhere on some of us and more, more obvious on others. That originates from your rib cage, from the, from the lower edge of your ribs, and that tra traverses down the anterior abdominal wall, and then it attaches to the front of the pubic bone. Then your adductors, which are the muscles that allow you to squeeze your legs together, and they're very important uh, as a part of this apparatus. Um, they extend from the front of your pubic bone down to the inside of your femur. And so because that's the most commonly involved apparatus when it comes to core muscle injuries, and also it's the vital central stabilizer of your core that creates the boundary of the core. So we define a core muscle injury as any muscular injury involving the body from the chest to mid thigh. And so that does include wow. hamstrings, glutes, lumbar muscles. We tend to be more commonly working on the anterior musculature, uh, but certainly the pattern of injury very often involves this apparatus plus some of the hip flexors, and then very often there's kind of secondary involvement of the other muscles as well. And so really we'll, when we use that term core muscle injury, it's, it's, it's a little nonspecific, which creates a little confusion on, on its own. But what we're trying to get people to thinking about is, well, if you said it's a core muscle injury, which muscles are involved? And that's a great mm -hmm. question because then you can start saying, well, this injury involved the rectus abdominis, the adductor longus, and the ilius psoas. And now we're getting the specifics as opposed to kind of these generalizations where, you know, you can kind of gloss over and maybe not get specific about what we're talking about. And you use imaging to help you in your evaluation. What imaging, Absolutely. what imaging do you rely on? We rely very heavily on MRI. Okay. I think one of the main issues with this, uh, with the injuries involving the attachments to that pubic bone, which is, again, that's where the, this whole apparatus tends to break down, especially yeah. if you, uh, put a lot of load on that apparatus, which tends to be picking things up, twisting, turning, pushing, athletics, um, all of these things kind of load that apparatus in particular. And um, one of the, the markers is generalized inflammation around the pubic bone. Um, and that's fairly easy to visualize on something like a PET scan. 
But if you get a CT, it's very unlikely that you're going to see a large enough disruption of any of this thing to right. really see it. So what we need to what we need to see is just inflammation around the muscular attachment to the pubic bone, and an MRI is proven to be uh, the best in terms of sensitivity for this. Ultrasound is also very useful. The problem with ultrasound is uh, it's not as good as at visualizing the actual attachments to the pubic bone. It's, it's very helpful for seeing some of the secondary associated findings, but the MRI seems to be the most sensitive and specific for identifying these injuries. Do you ever use CAT scan? Only um, when we're concerned about either a fracture or we're, when we're trying to define the bony anatomy of the hip joint better. Stuff. Yeah, it's, it's pretty rare that we'll ever use it for anything involving the viscera. You know, that's more in the realm of hernias. Um, you know, certainly we end up treating some hernias just because, you know, people, especially athletes, like like to go to someone who understands the recovery process. Um, but right. our, our real expertise is, is with these muscular injuries. Yeah, I'm a big fan of MRI as well. I've, I've seen it because I do mostly groin. I mean, I do all hernias, but the majority of my practice is based on the groin hernias and groin pain. So the pelvis is just so much better visualized by MRI. The problem is that the, um, uh, the most people don't know how to read MRIs or, and radiologists also don't know how to interpret it from a surgical, like hernia growing pain standpoint. Yep. So like specialty areas like you probably do very well. Um, I read my own MRIs. So that's kind of how I got around it. Um, and I have a handful of radiologists that I can kind of rely on, but I think because MRI is really not made it into our world in the general surgery that much that we just don't use it. And then people get CAT scans thinking like CAT scan will just see everything and it's not true. It doesn't necessarily. Yeah, absolutely. Differentiating the muscles of the abdominal wall. I think the MRI really opens up a whole new level of, of, of detail that you just don't see on a CT. In addition, I think one of the things that's important if you're out there and you're thinking about, well, geez, maybe I have one of these injuries, what should I do? There's actually a protocol. If you just get a regular MRI of the pelvis, it's a shame. It often will show you the ovaries and the uterus and your and rectum. Sacrum. Yeah. And it doesn't, yeah, and the sacrum, and it stops yeah. on the back end of the pubic bone and it stops on the sacrum. And so what you get is everything but <laughs> the muscular attachments to the pubic bone. It's just Very such a shame. Right. I, I get a lot of people sending me their MRIs. Hey, what do you think? Is it worth the trip to Philly? And sometimes I have to say, well, I don't know because unfortunately they missed by an inch. Yeah, so very correct. So if we you have order some, it, correct, very correct. Thank you for that. We have some easy questions and some hard questions. I'm going to start with an easy question. All right. But we already have a hard question uh, posted up. <laughs> okay. So um, one thing is that people get when they get groin pain, they have. Um, hip pain or they get imaging and it's shown they have a hip. So here's the, the first question, which is how common, uh, given how common hip labral tears are in the general population, how do you determine if the labral tear is a cause of groin pain? Do you have a way to help differentiate? So uh, just as background, a couple months, three months ago or, or so, we had um, one of the hip specialists that I use. And the reason why I've learned a lot from him is groin pain can be from hip problems and hip problems can give groin pain. So, and, and hernias. So there's a lot of overlap mm -hmm. between hernia pain and groin related problems or hip problems. And you get an MRI or a, a imaging and it shows labral tear is hard to determine. Is that a real one that needs intervention or is there a groin disorder? So how do you determine if the labral tear is the cause of pain or there's another reason for groin pain? Yeah, it's a great question. So in, in some research that's been done, especially as MRIs have gotten more sensitive, they've, they've shown labral tears and impingement morphology uh, in the hips of 85% or more of male athletes uh, in division one or pro sports. Wow. Okay. And in my practice, it's pretty darn close to 100% of my patients have some degree of impingement and some degree of labral pathology. About 15 to 20% of them have symptoms that can be attributed to that uh, anatomy and to that process. Mm, so that's, that's a great statistic. So 85 to 100% of people that are athletic or come see you for growing problems 
or core injuries have a labral tear on imaging, but only about 15% will have a true labral tear related pain. Correct. And so the way that I like to differentiate the hip, intraarticular hip pathology symptoms um, from the other, uh, the other symptoms are in, in, when we're talking to you, very often, if you tell me it hurts to sit for too long, or if it hurts to cross your legs, or you used to be able to put your shoe on easily, but now that right leg, it's a little harder to get your shoe on. Uh, you have a hard time lying on your right side. Um, things that involve hip flexion will become more difficult. Right. That's much more of an indicator that the hip may be playing a role. In addition, in males, when you say that you have testicular pain, it's very important to get specific. And I I spend my career below the belt, um, as do you, I mean, dealing with this area. It's so easy to say, well, it hurt by my testicle. You know, it's my, it, and so then everybody goes to the ER for their testicular torsion ultrasound, which is normal. Correct. And then if you really break it down and say, okay, let's, let's put our finger where this pain is, you realize very often it's not the testicle. But if you really do attribute pain in the testicle, in my practice, and this is very different than your practice, I imagine, just because of the nerves that tend to get irritated by hernias. But in my practice, if they have true testicular pain, that's actually more of an indicator that they may have a hip problem than a muscular injury. That's a very good point because no one thinks that a hip can cause testicular pain. And it's one of those, like what we call atypical presentations, which is actually not that atypical, but just no one, put, no one uh, puts the two and two together. Very, very good point. Thanks for that. And I think one of the things that we're finding is that you and I get the atypical presentations more yes. often than not. If it's a typical hip pet presentation, you know, they're not coming to our clinics, they're going to the specialist's clinic right away. But also I feel that orthopedic surgeons, similar general surgeons, they learn something in a textbook and they also may not see that patients that they should be treating for a labral tear or impingement um, because of the testicular pain. I mean, they're usually more than just testic testicular pain, sure. but that one detail throws them off, I feel. Right. Yeah. And there's a lot of hesitance to get too involved in the urologic or, or even potential hernia type issues. A lot of orthopedic surgeons want to get cleared from the general yes. surgery perspective yeah. before they'll do their hip. And I think a lot of times that that willingness to kind of be more inclusive and be a little bit uh, more aggressive, you realize, yeah, this is not an uncommon complaint that patients We have. had a question about this, uh, I think two weeks ago. If you had a patient that truly had hernia, like a true inguinal hernia, not complicated, but a hernia that was truly symptomatic mm -hmm. and they had a bad hip, not necessarily liberal term, let's say they need a hip replacement, sure. which one would you do first? Hmm. Um, be, because of the way I think the world works, I would probably fix the hernia first um, because most hip replacement surgeons want no potential for sepsis or bacteremia. And I think uh -huh. that the, the hernia repair does have this very, very low risk of infection oh, yeah. or perhaps, you know, bowel injury or something like that, in which case most of the hip replacement surgeons that I know want that healed and gone before yeah. they'll resurface anybody. I agree. I think that's, uh, that's what I recommend too. Also, I think you need to go undergo some pretty good physical therapy after your hip. And so having a hernia, some people are reluctant to do much. It's not, you're, it's okay to do it, but you know, there's a general population reluctance to, to do any type of physical exercise when you have a hernia. So getting that, taking that out of the picture kind of helps. I think especially the way hernia repairs go now i mean this yeah you know, I, I know the concept of waiting on a hernia is is still it's less of a debate people are more aggressive with repairs right. since, since the minimally invasive approach has come along but frankly when i counsel patients that have a hernia they think hey when should i get this done i say just do it because if there's any limitations on your activity level that's gonna that's gonna have repercussions overall and, you know our whole foundation our whole institute is built on just keeping people active and so yeah. i think if there's anything that's keeping you from moving you want to get that out of the way very true. Okay, now the hard question. So this lovely lady, she's had three abdominal operations, mesh put in, mesh taken out. Um, so this is her issue. She feels that she cannot engage her lower abdomen. Mm -hmm. She also has a softball-sized bulge 
but the cats cat scan shows no recurrent hernia i would debate whether that's true or not yeah, but yeah. you know i like to look at it myself um sometimes if it's not a humongous hole with a piece of bowel going through it the radiologist will not call the hernia but how would you let's say let's say she really does not have a hernia but she does have bulging in the lower abdomen and this inability to engage her core what do you think of that well certainly you know that that inability to engage the lower core muscles is something that people do complain about a lot Okay. Uh, one of the things that I think people who have had a bunch of surgery is you, you get abnormal sensorium. You can't quite feel what's going down there as well as maybe you had before the surgery. And so sometimes it really is, sim is a simple of feeling instability or an inability to engage those muscles. Mm -hmm. And that could be indicative of an injury there. And certainly when, they, when, the, when the rectus abdominis is starting to detach from the pubic bone, what tends to happen is there, there's, there's instability there. Yeah. Um, and you know, the most common presentation with that is pain, but we certainly do see a loss of function as well. And um, that may be playing a role with what she's having here. I think the bulge, that's harder to explain. I would be certainly uh, pretty suspicious of a recurrent hernia. I think sometimes yeah. if there's been a, you know, anytime you're taking mesh out, there's a, there's a larger risk for more kind of traumatic injury. And so if there's been denervation to a segment of that musculature, uh, for, we see it in the obliques, I, you know, I don't know that I've seen it in the central rectus abdominis area, right. but certainly the obliques, when they become paralyzed, then you can get that paradoxical movement. So you can get some protrusions related to that. Yes. Um, so I'd be, I'd be interested in something like that, but although, uh, yeah, again, I'd love to see that CT as well. Or you may not have a true hernia, which is a hole, but you may have a stretching out of a scar tissue, which is more like a diastasis. So there's no true hole, but it's so weakened and, and imbalanced, I guess. Um, yeah. Okay, next question has to do with age and sports injuries. So what are your thoughts on a 70 year old who's not an athletic male that was diagnosed with a rectus tear and osteitis pubis? Would you operate on them the same way as a professional athlete? And do you tend to treat many seniors in your institute? Um, yeah, so my experience, our experience here at the Institute is really a by, there's, there's two peaks of the age of the population. The first peak is really that 18 to 24, your old athlete who's at the peak of their performance and their training and they're just putting tremendous load on their body. Yeah. The other peak is more, uh, you know, around 50 when, when your career and your family life is stabilized to the extent that you can kind of strap the boots back on and get back into shape. And that's mm -hmm. when we see a lot of people get hurt again. And frankly, um, for me, age is a non-factor. There's, there are parts of the body that have um, expiration dates and I think cartilage is, is an important one. So certainly when you're talking about having intraarticular hip pathology, you know, you worry about arthritis, you don't necessarily want to operate on someone to fix their labrum if they have a labral tear, if there's a big threat of arthritis. But when it comes to reattaching these muscles, yeah, there's, there's really no reason age should play a role. It's overall fitness. You know, are you active? If you're active and you enjoy exercising enough to injure yourself in this way, then you're going to be able to handle physical therapy, which is the vital part of the recovery process. And so I, I wish I could show you the video, but I have a 82 year old uh, former army gentleman who really enjoyed doing L pull-ups. And um, really? two months after I repaired his big injury involving erectus abdominis and adequate on both sides, he sent me a video of him just cranking out 20 wow. L pull-ups. And I went and tried to do one and it was embarrassing. So um, what are your thoughts on over diagnosis of sports injuries? You know, I see women, you know, they're like mothers, they maybe walk with their friends and they're told they have a sports hernia. What they really have is an ingual hernia that no one can feel. Or um, like this gentleman, 70 year old, he probably has a recurrent ingual hernia or something like that. But the imaging kind of throws you off because he may also have other findings or maybe that's an overcall on the imaging. Um, what do you think about people that are not into sports that are getting rectus tears or adductor tears or told yeah. that that's what they have? That's an interesting question. So I, you know, I'm certainly biased looking for these injuries. And so I think one of the things that's keep in mind is that, you know, there, there has been this concept that only athletes get these injuries. And I think there's, um, okay. there's a lot of load, even at, at complete rest, that rectus abdominis adductor apparatus has tremendous load on it. And so it can be something as simple as, 
Um, well, childbirth is one, um, like a okay. vaginal delivery involves kind of putting your hips into flexion and, and that downward pressure certainly can rip these muscles, um, can also cause hernias. Um, yeah. But then, you know, we have laborers, uh, police officers, firemen, they're using their bodies just as much as an athlete. And it really is a, um, the, the more fit you are, there's perhaps more load on this apparatus, but I also think people who have an accident or a slip or an odd trip uh, who are not in great shape are, are probably more susceptible to these injuries. Um, okay. And so it's a, it's a, it's a little bit of a, you know, I don't, I don't think everyone has this injury, certainly not, but it's, I think it's actually really common to have these injuries. One of the things that I've noticed is um, once like an athletic trainer, at a school understands this injury and has a couple of kids on their, on their team, you know, present, get it fixed, realize that that's, what's been hurting them for a season or two, all of a sudden other, other athletes from other teams at that same school start coming, realizing that maybe this is the problem with this person. I thought it only affected football players and soccer players, oh. but here's a gymnast. And so I think it actually is more common than maybe we, we realize. but then again, uh, the question of overcalls on MRI, I have not had that experience. I spent okay. a lot of time reading MRIs that were read as normal, as abnormal, but I think okay. it's um, it's all about who the radiologist is and how, how, how you're, you're in a part of the country, I think, where awareness is just generally better than other parts of the country. I think yeah. we have a lot of people who are at the forefront and there probably is a lot of sports medicine bias, um, but certainly I see people from all over the country who've been suffering with these injuries for years and kind of had a bunch of normal imaging that turns out to show a pretty okay. obvious injury so good to know okay next question also uh someone's father i, I think they're they may be watching us so this lady her dad had an angle hernia repair june 2019 i believe open i'm not sure if she's on hopefully she can let us know he was in no pain from the hernia before surgery he was told it may be the cause of lower back pain i like your opinion about that let's just stop right there so do you believe that lower back pain can be caused by angle hernias? Because I do. But it's, yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those things where I think the classic concept for people with low back pain is to strengthen your core. And so we get okay. a certain number of patients every year who were told to do a bunch of sit-ups and then <laughs> rip their rectus abdominis up in doing oh, so to protect their back. Wow. Um, so certainly I think anything that inhibits you from being able to fire your abdominal wall normally can certainly affect your back. And we tend to compensate in, in ways that hurt our backs. Uh, so certainly, I, you know, I always like to get the spine docs involved before yes. attributing too much, but if, especially if, if it's kind of mi minimal, you know, perhaps non-operative low back pathology, which again is basically ubiquitous in our population. Right. Uh, then fixing the hernia is probably the best way to get get them strong enough to, to, to get out of pain. So after surgery, he was in horrendous pain in the lower abdomen and groin, he, especially with bending. He became bedridden. And the following year, January 2020, he had an ilioingual neurectomy, which actually made it better, 85% better. Mm -hmm. Then later that year, August of 2020, he was playing golf and he took a full golf swing and immediately felt a tear in the groin surgery area. The pain is now constant and very sore and sensitive to touch. So he had a hip MRI, which showed the labral tear, and he had a pelvic MRI, which shows moderate degenerative changes to the hip on both sides, thinning of the distal right rectus abdominis and tendon, approaching its insertion, but no defined tear or edema. So what do you think of those two imaging findings, just first Im impression? Um, yeah, so again, uh, depending on the age of this gentleman, I think degenerative changes and labral tears would be the equivalent of normal. Okay. Uh, so it, it, for me, that's, again, more common than not. And then, you know, no, no defined tear or edema at the pubic bone. I, you know, assuming that's correct, I always like to look at the images myself, but that that's an important consideration. Um, that's important information there. So then certainly the labral tear could be the culprit. Um, and the way I describe where you feel a labral tear is if you took a rope and you just kind of tied it in a loop around your leg and then just cinch it up as high as it goes 
you know, around, around your, where your leg meets your body, uh -huh. you can have pain from the labral tear anywhere in that distribution. The Very classic, good. Okay. Yeah, the classic pain is that C sign where people say it hurts right here and they kind of put their hand on their hip. Yes. But it really, that, that line has to go all the way in a circle, all the way around your body for you to really understand the distribution. And frankly, History and physical exam are really important, but the other thing that's very useful is if you just do an intra-articular hip injection of numbing medicine, okay. and if that alleviates his pain, that's a really great indicator that that's the culprit, and it's also a great indicator, predictor of success if he were to have surgery. That's a great point. So the, I love that analogy. So you're basically pointing to kind of testicle and then the groin crease. Yes. All the way around the hip, and then like the upper buttock or, or kind of buttock area. Correct. Correct. That's a great one. And then with the injections for the hip to see if it makes the pain go away, how often does that actually? How predictive? How predictive is that? Well, I'll tell you um, from a from a positive predicted value, it's, yeah. it's very good. Um, and certainly, there's a. Uh, 85% of people who either get an increase in their pain or a decrease in their pain from the hip injection, 85% of them have um, good outcomes from their eventual hip arthroscopy. That is to say, you know, they have basically pain scales and functionality scores, um, and they've set a threshold on that modified Harris hip score. And so 85% of those patients with a positive result from the injection um, have a positive outcome. Which is, okay. which is great. And so that we have some people who you do that injection and they can't quite tell. Or it's, you know, it's really, you got to get it really. So, so I'll say, I don't do the hip injections. I have a, I have a wonderful MSK radiologist. Yeah. He's a Jefferson radiologist who I, I asked him to do all the injections because I know if he did it, if you, if you stick the needle in a couple times, it just creates so much pain that the whole test is kind of yes. gone. And yes. the, the pain response is just such a vital piece of the equation that it's important to have a really talented person do it. A lot of the hip surgeons do it themselves for that reason, which I think is smart. Right. Um, but that's that's one very, it's not definitive, but it's a nice piece of the puzzle. If you get no response, if it doesn't affect the pain at all, then it makes it pretty unlikely that it's the hip causing the pain. Okay, so that's a really good uh, study to do. It's, it's very low risk to just inject the hip joint with local anesthetic. If the pain goes away, it's your hip. And this gentleman, so I'm confirming because he's actually online live. So right. welcome, thank right. you. He had opening little hernia repair, I assume with mesh. Mm -hmm. And he also had, he's 69 years old. So we're saying most likely the MRI findings of the hip um, are appropriate for his age or not unexpected for his age, I should say. Right. And then I think that, what do you think of this, this story about the full golf swing? feeling an immediate tear i i've seen the mesh just pull away from its from where it's been secured and that's where the pain is yeah i'd, I'd be surprised that they wouldn't have removed the mesh in that january surgery um but maybe that's my own bias there so if that mesh is still in place you know, i would certainly think that it uh might have disrupted from its attachment state yeah, I mean, if it's just purely, um, oh, the mesh is gone now. Okay, so there's no mesh. All right. And, you know, ripping up that scar. One of the yeah, things that I like to do um, to help diagnose this, uh, you know, I'm surprised there's not some information somewhere on that MRI. It just, it does make me question the MRI a little bit that it doesn't show any inflammation related to this process. But if we can, uh, let's say if having him do a sit-up you know, really contracting that abdominal wall musculature that elicits some of that pain. Then, you know, to help drive that point home, sometimes I'll just another differential injection just to include that within that rectus sheath. Um, and if, if he has disrupted some of that scar tissue in a way that's created some inflammation yeah. that's causing his pain, that'll help confirm it. And then also sometimes that serotonin injection calms it down enough to kind of give him some relief and, and, and it may scar down in a way. That, uh, and also if the mesh was removed, Either he had no further surgery or he had a tissue repair that can also bust open and he could just have a sure. single hernia recurrence, which some oftentimes is not reported on an imaging study. Absolutely. Yeah. So perhaps an ultrasound. Good example. Unfortunately. Yeah. All right. These are really great questions. Thank you guys for asking. Okay. Let's, let's do another um, kind of more complicated one. So this has to do with just 
what are we talking about? What is the actual cause of pain of pubic plate disruption or groin yeah. strain? Why is there pain? Is it the muscle keeps tearing and it's the load is not offloaded? Is it there's an imbalance between that muscle, like the rectus muscle and the other muscles? Um, are there bony spicules? That's that great. That's a, that's a really good question. This person has done some reading. Yeah. Um, is it all right if I share my screen? Can I do that again? Uh, let me unshare so that you can share. Right. Yeah, go so ahead. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work off of this picture here. And so the, the answer is yes um, to that question. But the, the, reason, the reason core muscle injuries involving the attachments of the pubic bone hurt is there's two main factors. One is when you, when you develop these injuries, it's an acute on chronic process that involves just basically plucking muscle fiber by muscle fiber of the rectus abdominis and adductors off of this attachment to the pubic bone. And the way these muscles attach, it's important to realize that there's not like a true tendon in these attachments. There's actually skeletal muscle, real muscle fibers all the way up to this big ball of dense tissue around the pubic bone. And so you can just pluck off a couple fibers of erectus abdominis and they will retract and then just kind of seal in. And from the outside, the rectus muscle looks normal. It's just its footprint is getting smaller and smaller on the pubic bone. And the same process occurs for the adductors. And so one of the reasons you have pain from these injuries is that as that muscle pulls off, you lose its function. And you also oh. get associated scarring. And basically, if you just think about it, if you retract a significant portion of any of these muscles, it's just going to get bulky. And so we like to use the analogy of a compartment syndrome for any runners out there, where just the muscle is getting squeezed by its own fascial containment. And it just really has an inability to contract normally. And so sometimes people have pain kind of up along towards their belly button. Um, pretty commonly, we see that. And that's just related to the tearing of that muscle and how it's kind of remodeled in a way that is just too tight. But the majority of the pain that we see is related to the, the actual disruption of that fibrocartilage, that tissue around the pubic bone. Because once you've created imbalances in the pulling of the rectus abdominis and the adductors across the pubic bone, then that whole block of tissue becomes unstable and it shifts. Not in a way that we really can appreciate as anything other than pain. So that whole block of tissue shifts and fluid accumulates there. And that's what we can see on the MRI. And that's what's sometimes referred to as osteitis pubis. Yes. Sometimes that'll show up as extra fluid in the symphysis and it's kind of tracking in different places. And it kind of tracks wherever that whole fiber cartilage pulls off from the bone and it creates this space that fills in with fluid that shows up really nicely in an MRI. Yeah. And there's nowhere for that fluid to go. It's under tremendous tension. So it hurts. And eventually it gets pounded into the substance of the pubic bones and then the signal of the pubic bone on MRI gets super bright. And you can see that a lot of times and that's osteitis pubis and that's the yeah. most important cause of it. Uh, so, so it's a muscular injury, but then it's also that kind of the attachment to the bone that gets swollen and that can hurt as well. Yeah, that's really good information. Um, can you explain osteitis pubis? Yeah. Uh, there's, so I've seen osteitis pubis. There's also these like spicules you see mm -hmm. where the bone looks like it's got these crowns on it. Yes. Almost like spikes. Mm -hmm. um, what are those and, and what's the treatment for them? So uh, osteitis pubis is just a finding. Um, I think it was first used when the nuclear medicine studies were being used. And all of a sudden you would see, you know, people coming in with just a, a, an increased signal in their pubic bones. Um, and the most common cause is the muscular injury um, causing that fluid to accumulate there. The spicules really, if you, if you do a cadaveric, if you, if you dissect a cadaver and you look at the attachments, the fibrocartilage around the pubic bone is densely adherent. It's really hard to pry off. But if you artificially make that plane, when you peel it off, the, the surface of the bone is, is, it has spicules like that. It's, it's um, very irregular and spiky. And so that's often what you can see on the MRI and also if you're there and a big avulsion injury when everything's kind of, when that fiber cartilage plate ruptures and the whole thing retracts, you see this very irregular uh, bony surface. And it, um, yeah, so those spicules are usually an indicator of that inflammatory process because it just allows you to, the fluid kind of allows you to see the contour of the, 
of the bone there. Okay. And so the treatment for the pubic bone edema, the osteitis pubis, and, and that kind of like uh, spicules of the periosteum is really just to reattach the muscles. And then it's amazing. Once you restore the balance and the pulling from above and below, your body's able to kind of seal that whole apparatus back down and, and those findings go away. It's so interesting. And I noticed that the more athletic you are, the more you notice this imbalance that you're referring to. Uh, there are patients that have diastasis, hernias, all messed up body, and they don't even know any better. And then an athlete will have like a hernia this big and they'll be like, I can't do my activities. I feel like I'm, I, I can't engage my core. I'm like, you're, sure. and you fix the hernia, like they get better, but you're just restoring the core. It's kind of interesting uh, yeah. how that is. I think the hernias also create a, a very visceral sensation that doesn't necessarily trigger, oh, there's something poking through here when I do this movement but you just very quickly learn that you don't like that sensation and your body tends to shut down whatever creates it. And so I think a lot of people who have true inguinal hernias or disruptions of the attachments to the pubic bone without even realizing it, they just stop using that muscle because it doesn't feel good. Um, and pain is probably months down the line, but they've already stopped using correct body mechanics. Yeah, got it. Very good. Okay, um, let's see. A question about laparoscopic surgery. Uh, what are your thoughts on the use of laparoscopy and also the use of mesh when um, dealing with these strains, these tears, these plate sure. disruptions? So one of the most important things to understand about the injuries involving the attachments to the pubic bone is that these muscles attach on the front of the pubic bone. When you place mesh laparoscopically, it goes behind the rectus abdominis and behind yes. the pubic bone. And yes. so I think when we're talking about just restoring normal anatomy, when we're talking about reattaching these muscles, I think it's important to do so on the front of the pubic bone. There's actually this common attachment where the rectus abdominis comes down and the aperture's come up and you just restore this attachment. I think that's really important. And um, if you're behind the rectus abdominis and behind the pubic bone, you, you can place mesh across that gap and I think it will stop the process of that muscle peeling off if it adheres to the muscle adequately. Um, but I, I think from a repairing a muscular injury, it makes much more sense to me just to re reattach it. Yeah. Uh, in addition, because these muscles are opposed, they're pulling across the pubic bone, very rarely it does happen, but it's very rare that only the adductors or only the rectus abdominis is involved. And that's okay. just the nature of how this apparatus is constructed. The, the pulling from above relies on the pulling from below. And if you only correct one, very often you're not gonna get the results you're looking for. Um, I think laparoscopy is ideal. I think it's an, an, an amazing tool. It's a, it allows amazing visualization. The main issue for me is that the surgery to reattach things to the front of the pubic bone takes place in a part of the body where there's skin. Yeah. And then you start naming vital structures, nerves, blood vessels. Yeah. And so, you know, you, you toy with the idea of making a five millimeter incision, inserting a dissector balloon, but you know, that that's the delicate part of the surgery. It needs to be done carefully. So through a three, four centimeter incision, we can get access to the, that part, do the dissection, get down to the muscles and reattach them. I just, I don't think that that's something where you can allow the dissection to be done any other way until perhaps we can do everything on an even smaller level and do it, um, yeah. do that dissection through a tiny incision. Yeah. And I don't think it's helpful. And just really quickly about mesh. I'm, I am biased against mesh. I have a, yeah. you know, the, the injuries that I treat don't really require mesh. I mean, that was going to be my next question. Yeah. yeah the, the treatment so of our hernia. Quite, <laughs> go ahead. Mesh sorry. is quite an inflammatory product. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what you're dealing with has inflammation associated with it already with the tears and so on. So what, do you, what are your thoughts of that interaction where you're adding an inflammatory implant to an already inflamed angry area? I think I will tell you that there are lapis, very talented laparoscopic surgeons who place mesh for these injuries and have success. I mean, I've, I've seen it, but I also know I take out a lot of mesh and I deal with people who've had mesh repairs and mm -hmm. attempted these injuries and now 
here they are, they have mesh and they still have their injury. So I think it just, from a, from a mechanical standpoint, it just makes sense to reattach the muscles. The presence of the mesh, when it's really well-placed, talented surgeons are placing this mesh, it really is minimally invasive. I and mean, it's amazing how you can slip the mesh in the inguinal region um, and people are feeling great afterwards. The problem is if it's not correcting the problem, uh, that's, that's where we run into trouble. So I think probably inflammation associated with the mesh is pretty minimal as opposed to the inflammation from the injury. Uh -huh. uh, but my bigger concern is in especially really thin people who enjoy to do doing athletics, Ballerina uh, twisting, maybe. turning. Yeah. They are the ones that I think tend to feel the mesh. Yes. If you, if you sit and you lay down and you don't do a lot else, I don't think you're going to get bothered by the presence of mesh, but these people like you're talking about that feel something these minutia associated with their muscles are not going to like having a foreign object sitting next to their rectus abdominis. Um, and for the, the true core muscle injuries, it's just not necessary. And then um, talk to me a little bit about the options of suturing, which is kind of re-repairing mm -hmm. versus cutting and releasing. Mm -hmm. Both are done, right? Yeah. Well, okay. So the, the, the real name of the game is just restoring the normal balance. What tends to happen in these injuries is that you have a combination of, if you just imagine you're fraying a rope and the, and the strands are pulling off, what's left tends to be under tremendous tension. And so especially in the adductors, the, the portion of the muscle that hasn't given way yet is really tight. And so there has been a whole lot of understanding that if you just cut those things, it takes some of the tension off the pubic bone and the inflammation gets better. The problem is you're not restoring the normal anatomy, the normal forces across the pubic bone. And what tends to happen is as you get back into activities, you build up the inflammation again, that fiber cartilage is still shifting around. And so really, if you restore the balance from above and below, then that's what really allows it to heal. Um, but certainly there are people doing adductor releases. And um, I think in, in many cases, it makes the situation better because it takes that tension off. But uh, there are people who have that, you know, functional weakness, and then they still have the instability of the pubic bone, so they still get the, um, the pain associated with that. It makes a lot more sense just to reattach everything to me. And then, you know, um, as you know, as a general surgeon, you're probably trained in residency not to put any uh, sutures in the periosteum when you do a hernia repair, yes. but yeah. you are doing that now, right? So where is the disconnect? Um, I will tell you the, the, you know, that periosteum that's really thickened on the interior aspect of the pubic bone, you can suture that, um, without any issue. I think the, the old school hernia surgeon's idea of taking the giant proline and driving it through that tissue, uh, once you go deeper than the fiber cartilage, once you go deeper than the periosteum, you're going to create uh, edema of the pubic bone and pain. Um, but there's a layer that, you know, in that picture that I showed that baseball cover, you can suture yeah. that uh, without pain. And so I think that's the important layer to use. And it holds suture really well. Okay. Uh, this question has to do with the lady with, who couldn't engage her abdominal wall. Um, if absorbable sutures were used to close the diastasis recti and fix the umbilical hernia, um, should myofascial release to help with adhesion pain be avoided? There's no such thing as adhesion pain when it comes to abdominal wall. Um, what are your thoughts about use of absorbable sutures? Um, I th you know, I think when you're talking about a true hernia, I, I worry about it. I think there's, you know, more, more of a concern, depending on what suture you're using, but I think recurrence is more of a concern. Uh, certainly, diastasis is another one where you're, you're using attenuated tissue. Yeah, um, I think I, I'd, I'd worry about that thing occurring unless you used some sort of biologic or something to reinforce it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I understand that there may be in, instances where uh, permanent suture can or shouldn't be used in patients, but the standard is to use permanent suture and not using permanent suture always has a risk that once the suture is absorbed that that strength is no longer there. Um, okay, let's see. Can I raise one other point just about yeah. the diastasis? I think, um, you know, 
diastasis, I was taught very clearly that it, they don't cause pain. So you don't really have to do anything about it. And I think, you know, you've seen, I mean, it sounds like a large part of your practice is helping people with this problem. And uh-huh. they develop hernias, but then there's also some symptoms associated with the diastasis, not just cosmetic, but I think also the penetrating uh, nerves that go through the rectus as it slides laterally, I think they get stretched and you can get some of what's also called that anterior cutaneous nerve entrapment syndrome. And I think yes. correcting the diastasis helps people with some of that pain, um, not, not too uncommonly. And so I think perhaps this woman's diastasis is coming back apart and she's just getting yes. stretched on the face again. Yeah, diastasis is a big uh, core instability issue. Let's go back to the groin again. Can a core injury rectus tear, adductor strain, um, can that cause the appearance of an inguinal hernia or how can it mimic an inguinal hernia? Or can you have both? Do you repair both? Yeah, that's a great question. So yes, um, it, it really depends what we're talking about, but I, I'll say the larger rectus abdominis injuries, um, the rectus is kind of the central attachment to the pubic bone and the obliques really rely on that attachment for this for their position. And so as the rectus slides up, basically the floor of the inguinal canal starts to slide up with it if the injury gets severe enough. And so we certainly see people with large rectus abdominis injuries that have a direct hernia. Um, And that process is where this gets really confusing because if you just reinforce the floor of the canal, the hernia goes away and, and maybe that rectus injury stops progressing and they feel better. And that's where there's a tremendous amount of overlap. The majority of the muscle injuries that I see on the rectus side, there's not enough sliding back to cause a hernia, but that process, there's some point where it reaches that point. The other thing is if you put an ultrasound probe over the inguinal canal, yeah, and as that floor of the canal is getting thinner, as the muscle yeah. slides away, you'll see it start to bow, um, to bulge out uh, when they bear down. And that's a really interesting finding. And so some of the ultrasound te- uh, ultrasonographers that I work with who do all ultrasound based uh, needle-based techniques, they say, oh, this is a hernia. You see this thing? It's all, it's bulging out. And part of this is semantics. I say, well, maybe, but it's just from their muscle injury. And they say, no, 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 it's, it's a hernia, fix the hernia. And so yeah. I don't know who's right on that one. That's just a little bit of a screwdriver versus a hammer discussion. Yeah. Um, but certainly the majority of the hernias that I fix, I find incidentally, it's a tiny little sac that's a congenital indirect that's been there forever. And it's completely unrelated to the muscle injury. Every once in a while in a severe enough muscle injury, there's a direct hernia that's uh, perhaps contributing to the symptoms, but I I think it's usually the muscular injury. Whereas if they just have an obvious true hernia, um, you know, I think they're usually getting that fixed before they get to me. If they, let's say they don't go to you, they go to their local community surgeon and the ultrasound shows exactly that. And they say, oh, you have a hernia and they go to the surgeon, the surgeon does a hernia repair. Is that a bad thing? Have they, have they burned any bridges? Are they gonna have more chronic pain or can that actually treat and stabilize their, their injury? That's a great question. So I think that's something that I would love to look at prospectively um, yeah. because I don't know. The bottom line is I don't know. I only see the people who have had mesh placed who still have their pain and they clearly have a muscular injury. Got it. If you place laparoscopic mesh well, um, it, it's, it's amazing. It's such a benign procedure that, that, you know, in some cases people have just used that as a part of their diagnostic workup. They said, well, maybe I have a hernia, place the mesh and eh, my pain's still there, but there's literally no drawbacks to having the mesh there. Okay. Then, you know, I think that's great. The problem is if someone places the mesh and it wrinkles up and now it's, yes. you know, pushing into their abdominal wall, then that creates all this new yes. pain that, you know, can make things worse. And I think that's frustrating, but I think in the hands of a really skilled hernia surgeon yeah minimally invasive inguinal hernia repair is a very safe procedure uh the question is does the myers repair address the laxity in the inguinal canal that you just discussed it does yeah so restoring the normal attachments corrects that okay and do you use mesh for your hernias or uh much for your canal? i'm pretty biased against mesh just because i have to take so much of it out yes um, and I will also a hybrid say, mesh, like not necessarily synthetic, pure synthetic, but some of the hybrid out, products out there. 
I played around with it a little bit. Okay. I think it makes sense. I think um, the problem is I don't think that the mesh itself is usually, unless it's placed in a way that again, it's bulging out and causing actual mechanical issues. Yeah. Usually it's the scarring from the mesh, which like you said, like the mesh is designed to create fibrosis. That's, that's part of its strength. Yeah. Um, and I think the scarring from the mesh, if that gets too close to a nerve or creates enough rigidity of the abdominal wall that it becomes uncomfortable, that's the problem. And so I'm, I tend to shy away from use of mesh. I'll use um, probably a smaller amount of mesh than anybody who trained me how to do hernia repairs would want. Um, mm -hmm. If I do end up using it, just to try to just reinforce my suture holes as opposed to got it. broad coverage. Yeah, got it, I understand that. Okay, last question is kind of a comment as well. She says, thank you for explaining this so well. This sounds so much like the pain I'm having. I was first diagnosed with the hip tear and FAI, which is femoroacetabular impingement. I developed a bulge after I did a plank and developed back pain and pubic pain. And they did the angular hernia repair without any imaging first. The pain has been off the charts ever since, ever since and I have been debating on having the hip labral tear repaired and the FAI repaired. Not sure if it will make my pain worse or not. I mean, the bulging doesn't make sense, right? Right. Well, I mean, I will say, I mean, I, I, you're the hernia specialist, but I don't think imaging is necessary if you've got a hernia on exam. Correct. I don't see any reason to do anything else. So I, I, I hope that that was the logic uh, for the hernia repair, but it sounds like there's a diagnostic workup that needs to be done. Yes. And, you know, I, I, um, I would not rule out the hip, but certainly I, I would want to put you through some uh, physical exam or potentially some numbing up different spots to make sure we identify what's causing your pain and then fix it. Yeah, what I would want to know is what kind of pain are you in now? Is it different than uh, the pain that you originally underwent hernia repair for? Um, or did, did the hernia repair not address the original pain? So if it's the former where you had a hernia repair and now that pain's gone, but you have new pain, then something is related to your hernia repair. And if you're an athlete or thin, you know, that you're more likely to have symptoms from a, a more standard repair. And then if it's the same pain and just didn't change, then yeah, we should look at all these other reasons for growing pain besides your, your hernia, which could be core. What's the right term? What term should I be using? I've been using everything today. The sports hernia, yeah. groin strain, rectus tear, plate disruption. What do you yeah. use? Those are all great words, except for I'm, I'm really trying to kill sport hernia because yes. it just creates so Thank much confusion. You. But I like core muscle injury because it's a little bit of a catch all. But if you say rectus tear, um, I think people understand. And the, the issue is that most rectus tears have a uh, reciprocal adductor tear that gets overlooked. And that's part of the problem. So I, I like core muscle injury just to keep it. The other thing is we haven't even gotten into it, but like, especially in women, very common to have ileus psoas involvement. Um, rectus femoris is another one that's commonly involved. And so yes. if you got that stuff, especially ileus psoas impingement, or, you know, when that, that's a big hip flexor in, in your back, uh, that crosses into the front and attaches on your inner thigh that can cause mm -hmm. inner thigh pain. And when it's inflamed, it can create things like pelvic floor dysfunction, especially yes, we see that awesome. diagnosed more common in women. Although I think it's just as common in men. We're just, um, just still figuring a lot of that stuff out because of our anatomy being different. Um, but I think that's the point is to find the entire extent of the injury before doing anything. I think that's really, yeah, good. it sounds like the hernia repair did not fix the original pain and added to new pain. So now she's got two problems. Yeah. So I would look at someone to deal with your hip as well as someone knowledgeable for your groin. Um, yeah. Can I make so one other comment. Yeah, absolutely. Just about that. Sorry. I think it's um, important to it's hard to go to a hip specialist and say, is this my hip? And then go to someone who might be able to diagnose the core muscle injury and say, is this, is this a muscular injury? And then someone else to say, oh, is this pain from, from my mesh? It's, that has to be a coordinated effort. And I think there's different places around the country where you can get that done, but it's more often than not, um, you know, it's something that, that I think stepping out of the, the existing university system was important to get that done here. But I think, uh, it's popping up in different places around the country where you can get the general surgeon, pain management specialist, and the hip surgeon kind of all talking to each other at the same time is really helpful and important. I agree. I agree. But not everyone has the luxury of having all the specialists in one area or even in one city. Um, 
Very true. True. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're very privileged to have access to some of these people. Okay. On that note, I think we'll end it. Uh, thank you very much for your time. I hope you have a great evening. And I hope that uh, I can interview more people from your institute because I, I learned a lot tonight. So thank you, Dr. Port. Uh, I'll make sure that this is available for you all to watch over and over again and share uh, on YouTube. Thank you for following me. For those of you that are on Facebook at Dr. Tofi, I'll make sure that uh, the link to the YouTube is also uh, available on Twitter and Instagram to all of you. See you next week. Thank you, Dr. Poor, uh, for your time. And we'll do another session for you to talk Tuesdays in one week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.